Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Discover for Turby Aerospace Mechanical Engineering with Professor Julian Zamarotsky. Um, my name is Erin Tanaka, and we were going to go ahead and get started with the, the formal presentation. So just a quick uh, note before we get started is um, you will receive a copy of today's presentation. So you know, there, there will be quite a few links, especially towards the end of the presentation. So you know, no need to jot them down unless you need them right away. Um, we will send you a copy of the presentation within a couple of business days. Um, and also, we highly recommend that you ask questions you know, throughout the session. Um, my colleague, Megan Balding, will be available to answer any questions that you may have. If the questions pertain to um, the, the full group, then we can answer those aloud um, either during the session or after at the, during the Q&A um, portion of, of the session. But you know, we will uh, get to your question as soon as possible. So for today's program, I'll start out by talking about the University of Southern California, or USC for short, um, and then I'll specifically talk about the Viterbi School of Engineering. Then we'll go into um, the, the focus of the, today's presentation, which is, of course, our aerospace and mechanical engineering department and programs um, that Professor um, Zamarowski will be able to talk to you about, and then I will talk to you also about the online denovatory delivery method that we have available. We'll also talk about tuition and fees. And then if there are any questions um, that we did not answer throughout the session, then you'll have the opportunity to ask any remaining questions during the Q&A portion of the session. So for those of you that have not been to USC, here's some snapshots of our beautiful campus out here in sunny Southern California. And a little bit about USC. So we are the oldest private university in the Western United States. We were founded in 1880. Currently we have 44,000 students, 25,000 of which are our graduate student population. So our PhD students, master's students as well. We have under, uh, just a little under 4,200 full-time faculty members, and that doesn't include many of our guest lecturers that will often come in and lecture um, from a variety of different industries. And we're located in Los Angeles, so we have a very diverse student population. Um, we have students coming from over 100 different countries throughout the world. And being here in lo uh, located in Los Angeles, if you're not familiar with the area, we are right in the center of all the action. So we're about a 10, 15 minute drive of course, depending on traffic, from the downtown Los Angeles area, and we're also surrounded by multiple opportunities for internships and um, jobs in a number of different industries, of course, including our aerospace mechanical. Um, we are about a 45-minute drive, more or less, from the Silicon Beach area, which definitely has a lot of different opportunities at um, both large and startup companies um, for our students if you are in the area. So specifically about the Viterbi School of Engineering, so we are eight academic departments strong, of course our aerospace and mechanical engineering department, um, which is actually separate from the astronautical engineering department, which oftentimes schools combine the two. Um, we, are, we have 185 tenure track faculty members currently, over 20 of which are members of the National Academy of Engineering. We also have over 60 National Science Foundation um, career awardees and, um, and many other professors and faculty members that I will discuss um, in a bit. And currently we have over 65,000 Viterbi alumni strong. So pretty much anywhere you go in the world or in the US, um, there's likely to be someone who graduated from the Viterbi school um, either relatively um, recent or um, a long, long time ago. Um, so, and then our student population. Currently, we have 5,600 graduate students, which is actually about double that of our undergraduate student population. So here, um, within the Viterbi School, our graduate student population is definitely a major part of our campus. And um, whether our students are pursuing their program here on campus or online, our graduate student population, again, you know, con consists of our master's students, 
PhD students, and um, it's a big reason why we, you know, we have we are a leader in funded research. So we have research going on um, in a multiple array of um, different areas. We have over 45 research centers and um, and over 185 million dollars in annual research expenditures currently. So we know that the rankings aren't everything, but of course we like to point out the fact that we, you know, we have been consistently top ranked a graduate engineering program. And specifically in the online arena, we are ranked number one for all of our online graduate engineering programs. So that's across all 40, over 40 programs, of course, including all of our aerospace and mechanical engineering programs that we offer completely online. And we also are ranked number one for online computer science. And then those of you that may either be veterans or military, we all also rank number one for our online graduate engineering and computer science, specifically for our veterans population. So some key points of distinction. So we do have an international reputation for excellence. So you know we have partnerships at key organizations throughout the world. Um, whether that's India, Kuwait, China, et cetera. And um, what that really means is that when you graduate from the Viterbi School of Engineering, your degree um, is recognized not only here in the U.S., but also throughout the world. So that's really important there. Um, the Trojan Family Network. So this is something that is very unique and, um, and a huge benefit to being not only a USC Trojan, but a, a Viterbi Trojan specifically. So as I mentioned before, we have over 65,000 engineers, alumni strong. So what that means is whether you're a current student or an alum, you will have you know a, a wide range of, of alumni that you are potentially able to network with that are you know willing to to talk to you and speak with you. And you know time and time again, it's very common for you know Trojan Trojan family um, alumni to to meet and and talk to amongst one another, no matter where they are located in the world. Um, and then in terms of our programs that we offer, so we have everything from our online Jan and Viterbi programs um, on campus as well as on site. We also offer our complete range of programs, so everything from our bachelor's undergraduate degrees to our PhD program. We also offer graduate certificates, which I'll talk about in a bit, as well as short courses and custom <coughs> programs. So a little bit more about our research. As I mentioned before, you know, we are a leader in funded research. So if research is something that you're interested in, we have a variety of different areas um, across various topics, whether that's robotics or um, aerospace, aerospace um, mechanical engineering uh, fields um, that you're, you're interested in learning more about. Um, there definitely are a ton of different research that you can, pretty much anything you could think of um, is likely, um, you know, someone in, uh, within the Viterbi School of Engineering is working on. Um, and again, you know, over 45 research centers, we also have industrial partnerships and collaborations that are going on at any time. So if you're interested in, in research, you know, we do encourage you to visit our viterbischool.usc.edu um, website where there is more information about the specific research that is currently going on. So I now would like to introduce you to um, Professor Julian Damaratsky, um, who has graciously joined me today for the today's session. Um, he is a professor and chairman for the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering, and he has done uh, conducted uh, various research, including turbulence theory, um, turbulence modeling, as well as numerical simulations of fluid flow. He's also had um, research work um, in partnership with um, organizations such as the Office of Naval Research, the uh, Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Laboratory, or GPL, of course, the Department of Energy, as well as the National Science Foundation. So, you know, lots going on that he has done there. Um, definitely has a very strong resume and portfolio of everything that he's done. Um, so you are in great hands and in terms of having someone that is going to be able to talk a lot about the aerospace mechanical engineering programs um, that, that are currently being offered. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, there was a short introduction. My name is Julian Domaratsky, and I've been at USC for 30 years, 
in addition to research uh, that was already uh, outlined, I was teaching large number of classes, undergraduate and graduate classes, including many uh, in distance uh, education networks, something that uh, you are exploring right now. So uh, let me start with a few words about type of research that we are doing in aerospace mechanical engineering. There are several current research trusts. One uh, is biodynamical engineering. Uh, you would be surprised, of course, to know that uh, sometimes the uh, aerospace and mechanical engineering departments actually venture into areas uh, which are related to medicine and biology, uh, where we are trying to learn from biological systems how to apply uh, biological principles to mechanical devices. You can see also uh, under heading biodynamical engineering, uh, several organizations which are located here in Los Angeles area uh, where a faculty interact with and uh, also as students may be involved in uh, research, internships, etc. Another one is another uh, research focus is energy engineering. Uh, mostly I think our activity is in uh, combustion, so this is the last slide to the right where you see the flame. Uh, there is a lot of activity recently in autonomous systems and uh, generally robotics and advanced manufacturing, uh, which is uh, one area which is in the sort of uh, uh, quite uh, important for uh, local industry, especially aerospace industry. And finally, aerospace systems and technologies, uh, we have a large number, several big companies in Los Angeles area, Boeing, SpaceX, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and they all uh, always uh, require a workforce, trained workforce, and uh, this is what uh, we are providing. Uh, note also the line on the right in the vertical, fundamental science, uh, all these areas, uh, even if they are applied, are linked uh, through our approach to research uh, where fundamental science, uh, this is foundation of, on which uh, everything else is based. So this is about the research. Uh, let's skip to maybe next slide. Uh, here we repeat uh, to some extent uh, what are traditional disciplinary strengths. You can uh, read for yourself. Now I will uh, mention a few words about our students and uh, faculty and staff. We have uh, about 20 faculty uh, sort of permanently in the department, but there are a number of faculty with joint appointments and we have seven full-time lecturers. Uh, they lecture mostly for uh, undergraduate uh, students, so you may be probably less uh, in contact with them. In terms of number of students, we are evenly split between uh, uh, undergraduate and graduate population, so the total uh, fluctuates between 900 and 1,000 every year, and uh, at present time we are at the level of about the uh, active $20 million in active uh, research funding in any given year. Uh, our undergraduate uh, students uh, are actually well known for participation in various design projects, especially a airplane design project where uh, last year they placed first in the country, and they sort of jump between, you know, first, second, third uh, from year to year. And another one, the picture that you see, uh, sort of uh, uh, vehicle, uh, is a formula uh, SAE, uh, where students uh, design uh, for competition uh, some sort of uh, race car. Uh, but this is uh, 
pretty much for undergraduates. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, now, where our graduates find work and internships, as you can see in Los Angeles area, we have many different possibilities. Uh, typical big aerospace companies, starting with uh, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, through Aerospace Corporation, which is a company which supervises uh, all uh, launches by Air Force uh, in space. Uh, there are uh, Case, case composites, SpaceX, Aerovironment. Uh, these are somewhat maybe smaller but well-known uh, companies as well in the general Los Angeles area. Uh, there are peer schools, uh, UCLA, Caltech, uh, within uh, maybe 20 to half an hour drive, again, depending on traffic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are uh, several uh, government uh, aerospace-related uh, organizations such as uh, JPL and various uh, Air Force bases. Uh, there is, of course, Hollywood. Uh, uh, I think uh, you will be, you probably know that still equipment, lightning, etc. these things require also engineering. Uh, so there are uh, opportunities, but probably smaller than for uh, actual aerospace uh, companies. And with the sort of background in math and physics, uh, people sometimes go to work in finance uh, industry as well. Mm -hmm. We can move to the next slide. Now, specifically about our master uh, programs, we offer a general Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering and the Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Uh, so these are general degrees, but there are several more focused degrees. Uh, as you can see here, there is one in Computational Fluid and Solid Mechanics. I'm actually, I created that uh, specialization, so I will be able to tell you a little bit more about it. And uh, similarly, uh, there is dynamics and control specialization, energy conversion, and uh, product development engineering. So let's move to the next slide, which, uh, yes, yeah, so Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering, all programs actually require 27 units. Uh, classes are three unit uh, semester long classes. And each specialization requires these two uh, classes, engineering analysis, which is mostly linear analysis and uh, uh, complex variables, and engineering analytical methods. These are mostly uh, different Fourier Laplace transforms and uh, differential equations. And then you can choose a specialization track. There are several listed aerodynamics, fluid dynamics, aerospace controls, etc. Uh, but uh, what is, uh, I think, interesting about our program is that if you would like to build your own specializa specialization, maybe combining two of, uh, you know, areas such as uh, controls and propulsion, that is possible with a uh, advisement of uh, graduate advisors. We can go to the next one. So computational fluid and solid mechanics, this is, uh, the requirements here are much more strict because we are trying to cover uh, computational approaches both to fluids and solids, and uh, you have maybe less freedom to choose elective classes. As you see, uh, there are 21 units for required core classes. There is one technical elective in general area of either fluids or solids. And there is one computational uh, elective, uh, which you, know, you can select either from CFD or from finite element analysis. And if you go through that, uh, it is already 27 units. So there is not much room for anything else. However, uh, many of our students sometimes uh, can waive, let's say, one of the required core classes, uh, Mechanical Engineering Problems 404, AME 404, first one listed there. 
uh, is uh, introduction to computational methods. So if you had it uh, maybe as uh, undergraduate, or maybe you took it, uh, you know, in some graduate program, that class sometimes could be waived. So there would be room open uh, for uh, additional uh, electives. Let's go to the next one. Dynamics and control works in very similar way. There are 21 units of required core uh, classes, and then there are two elective uh, courses, again, usually taken uh, in area which, uh, you know, fits dynamics and uh, control description. So these types of uh, master uh, degrees uh, the previous one and this one are very focused for people who actually know that they want to do specifically uh, something like that. If you are not sure, uh, then usually the best idea is to take a, a general a MS a degree approach. We can move to the next one. Uh, so. MS in mechanical engineering, very similar to MS in aerospace engineering, required mass classes. And then uh, there is uh, some track that you select. And if nothing fits your interests, then we can uh, build something that would fit uh, you know, what you would like to do. Uh, in fact, usually students select a particular track because uh, these classes that fall within the track are often offered on permanent basis from semester to semester. Some other specializations, you know, the class may, might be offered once a year, and if it's a higher level, a PhD level class, uh, even less frequent. Energy conversion, uh, again, similar to focused programs, 21 units, uh, which are required uh, for everybody, and approved elective courses, six units, uh, which uh, normally uh, can be also replaced by something related. Uh, these programs uh, are developed and they do not change uh, maybe uh, in descriptions and catalog uh, as often. So if there are new classes coming online, uh, then with approval of a advisor, you can take new classes and replace those that are uh, shown here as uh, elective. So the fact that we have approved elective courses, these are not, this is, there are four listed here, but these are not all that you could take. And a program uh, in product development engineering, this is program between uh, aerospace mechanical, and there are a number of classes in industrial system engineering. You can see notation there, ISC. This is for classes in industrial system engineering. Uh, so this. Uh, here, you know, the program is uh, really between both departments, sometimes even uh, classes which are listed in one or the other department are in fact cross-listed between both departments. Well, dual degree program offerings, uh, these are very specifically uh, between the aerospace engineering and sub-section, I would say, industrial and system engineering, mm -hmm. uh, engineering management. Uh, so uh, these types of uh, programs usually require, uh, you know, coordination of advising between uh, both departments. Okay. So I'll um, continue on and I'll jump into talking about the application criteria for the master's degree programs. Um, so 
First of all, you would need to have an undergraduate degree um, or a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, Math, or Hard Science. So hard science including chemistry, biology, physics, etc. And it must come from a regionally accredited university. Um, to be competitive, although it's not required, we do recommend an undergraduate GPA of at least a 3.0 and a 4.0 scale. Of, but again, you know, it's not required. So if you don't quite meet that 3.0, that's okay. You can still apply. I just want to make sure that you strengthen your applications in the area that you can control. Um, so other areas that you, other parts of your application that would be required. So I did see quite a few questions about the GRE and whether it can be waived. And the answer is no. So the GRE is required. Um, if you've taken it le um, within the past five years, um, those scores could, are acceptable. Uh, but it has to be within the last five years. Um, otherwise, you know, you can take the, G the GRE. Um, there's no minimum score required. There's not a particular score they're looking for. Now, um, and, you know, if you take the exam and don't do as well as you'd like, you can take the exam again and we'll take the two highest scores. Um, a resume is also required. It's something that you would to upload through the online application system. Um, other supplemental materials include a statement of purpose. So you would need to sum submit a statement of purpose um, describing you know, the reasons why um, you would make a great candidate and also um, talking about how your degree program um, uh, what you you know what would like to accomplish in your degree program and why it interests you. Um, also, letters of recommendation. So these are optional, meaning that um, you know they're not required, but you um, you may submit them and they will be reviewed. So you know if there is a part of your application that may not be as strong as you like, or maybe there's a portion um, there's something that you've done in the past, whether it's work experience or academically, um, that is not. Um, included in the other areas or applications, and you are welcome to um, submit letters of recommendation where um, your recommenders can um, you know, speak to your academic ability as well as your eligibility as a, as a um, future student. Um, for, for the international applica applicants, um, so some of you that are international um, applicants, you would also need to take the TOEFL. Um, and there are more there's more information about the requirements there. If you have any questions, um, we can send that to you as well. But um, you'll definitely want to make sure that you consult the particular program um, that you that you wish to apply for, because there are you know some slight differences in each program um, that that is available. So be sure to do that as well. So for application deadlines, um, the next application deadline for formal admission is for the fall 2018 semester. So the deadline to submit all required materials is going to be January 17th. Um, for those of you that are interested in, in pursuing a program on campus, there is a deadline scholarship consideration um, or for scholarship consideration, and that's December 15th. So you'll, make sure, you'll want to make sure that you um, meet that deadline as well. Um, and then if fall 2018 is too soon, so just so you know, the fall 2018 semester, that does start in August of next year. Um, but if that's too soon, then the spring 2019, although it seems like it's a long time away, it's actually not really, um, but the deadline to submit all your required materials for that would be September 15th. And again, there is a scholarship consideration deadline for on-campus students um, of August 31st. For those of you that are um, are looking to pursue their program online via Jennifer Turby, there's a little bit more flexibility oftentimes, so the, there may be a deadline extension, um, especially for the fall semester. So um, you know you can also email us if, if you have any questions about that. So for course delivery methods, um, there are two de delivery methods. So one being our on-campus traditional, full, um, in which you're going full-time. Um, our students typically take three classes per semester, and because of that, they're, they're finishing in about one and a half to two years to complete. So I saw a question about you know, how long it takes. And, um, and that can actually vary, though, because if you are pursuing your program online via Denevaturbi, because a large majority of our Denevaturbi students are working full-time, they have flexibility to take you know, one course per semester 
most students take one course. Um, some, you know, take two classes per semester depending on on their work schedule and, and their personal lives. But because of that, or even still, you know, our, our online students are still graduating about two and a half to three years. So again, you know, it's flexible as long as you complete your degree program within five years with the ability to petition for additional two years, um, you you're, you are welcome to take the number of courses you can take during that semester. So moving on to talking a little bit about our Geneviterbi delivery method. So if you're not familiar with Geneviterbi, it's basically our online delivery method that's considered a blended model. So what that means is that any courses that you are taking as a Geneviterbi student, you are in the same exact course as the on-campus student. So there's no difference whatsoever. You're doing the same exact lectures. You have the same exact professors. So, and you would be able to view the lectures in one of three ways. So the first being that you would be live, um, you would you know, join the session live, similar to today's presentation, um, you, but you would also be able to call in during the live lectures. You can also, of course, um, chat your questions um, in, in a similar Q&A function there. Um, and then the students and um, the, the professors can also hear you, of course, and answer your questions. Um, and then you would also be able to watch the lectures on your own time. So, you know, oftentimes a lot of our um, Denver students are not able to attend classes um, during the live session. So in that case, they are able to um, watch it via the course archives. And that's available um, when it, um, about, you know, 15, 20 minutes after the live recording to the very end of the semester. So oftentimes our students will um, either watch it for the first time via the course archives or even go back. And it's a great studying tool that many of our students really like to use. Um, and then in terms of, oh, sorry, third option. So the third option is, um, is great. Um, you also have the ability to come to campus, although I did see a question that, you know, is it required to come to campus? And the answer is no. So as, as an online Jennifer student, it, it can be pursued completely 100% online. However, if, you know, you're in the area or maybe visiting um, Los Angeles area, you're more than welcome to come to class, even though it is not required. Um, and, and, you know, of course, you know, professors love to meet you and, um, and as well as your peers. So that is an option as well. Um, in terms of homework, you would submit it electronically, um, either via the, the course management system or email, depends on the professor, um, and then exams. So in terms of exams, if you are within um, a 25-mile radius of campus, then you would actually take your exams on campus. Um, if you're outside of that area or in a different state or different country, you would take your exams at a proctoring location. Um, Sometimes it's a university, sometimes it's um, a library, other times for those that work for a corporate company, um, sometimes there is an HR professional or a supervisor that is able to um, practice your, your examinations, then that is a possibility as well. So this gives you a side-by-side -side comparison of, of what a dentistry student's experience is like versus on-campus students. So, the program mission requirements are absolutely no different. There is no difference in the uh, graduate application as well as the required material, materials there. Uh, the weekly course lectures, again, as I mentioned, Denver students watch it one of three ways. On-campus students come to campus. Um, the course archives, um, our students, um, you know, have all Denver students have access to the course archives. And if, as long as there's at least one Denver student in the classroom, then the on-campus students also have access to the course archives. So um, in that regard, you know, everyone gets the, has the opportunity to use those as a great studying tool there. Um, for assignments, again, you know, electronically via course deadlines. So it's really important that, you know, if you don't attend the live lectures as a Denver student, that you make sure that you stay up to speed with assignments because those are the same deadlines and the same assignments as the students on campus. Um, for degree completion requirements, there are 27 to 37 units with a 3.0 GPA or above. And again, because, you know, there's no difference in admission, um, lectures, assignments, exams, et cetera, there's no distinction whatsoever on your diploma that you're an online student. 
So this gives you an idea of just, you know, what a class, Denovitrophy classroom looks like. So within each classroom, there is um, behind the scenes, there's a camera operator that is ensuring that everything that you, that is going on on campus can be heard by you, um, whether that's what, what can be heard or um, what you see. So whether the, the lecturer is, um, or the professor is um, taking notes on an overhead type projector or on the smart board, um, then you'll be able to see that very up close and personal. Um, so this gives you another snapshot of our e-learning system. So um, it's very user friendly. You can, again, you can see it up close and personal. You can also control how you watch it. So you can jump to a certain part of the lecture. You can actually speed up or slow down the lecture, which some people actually do. Um, so you really have the flexibility to watch it how you, how you like. So this gives you another snapshot. In this case, the, the professor is using a smart board, which is definitely more and more common. Um, so it's a, it's a great interactivity tool that um, a lot of our faculty members have, have used and kind of replaced old, the old uh, chalkboard and uh, whiteboard there. Um, so, so oftentimes, you know, you will have a um, will have student interacti interactivity or group meetings, group projects. Just really depends on, on the course there. Um, but in that case, you know, our Gen and Fisherman students have access to a variety of different resources. So, you know, for example, there's Blue Jeans, which you see at the top left there, um, which is a great way that a lot of our students really like to interact because it's very high definition. It gives you that face to face contact. Um, other students use Google Hangouts. There's WebEx, of course, what we're using today, Adobe Connect, et cetera. So, you know, it's really a matter of pre preference. And um, I know that our faculty members, as well as TAs, um, are, you know, are willing to, you know, set up time, a time to, to discuss any questions that you may have if, if maybe you cannot necessarily make it to um, the specific um, office hours, obviously it's great if you can, but if not, then you can um, work with them to, to set up a time um, to work with you. Um, again, you can call in during live lectures, um, as well as participate in live chats and threaded discussions, which sometimes are, are required depending on the classroom. So to wrap it up with Den of Viterbi, so is there any difference between earning a master's degree on campus versus Den of Viterbi? And the answer to that is absolutely no. So hopefully you've gathered that, as I mentioned before, you know, Den of Viterbi, it's a delivery method. So you have, again, same admission criteria, curriculum exams, graduation requirements, et cetera. So you, you are earning the same exact diploma, whether you earn the degree on campus or online via Den of Viterbi. So if you're earning a Master's of Science in Aerospace Engineering, you're earning a Master's of Science in Aerospace Engineering, period. No online distinction whatsoever. So a little bit more. So I know that I saw some questions regarding deadlines and as well as taking the GRE and not having enough time. Well, there is um, an option called limited status. So limited status is an enrollment option in which it allows strong candidates with a at least a 3.0 on a 4.0 GPA that have an en engineering related degree um, to start taking classes before you know formally applying for admission or having to take the GRE. So, you know, if you need more time to take your, the GRE, but like to get started as early as, as this coming spring semester, which starts in January, then um, limited status may be an option that you will want to look into. Um, so a couple of things about limited status, um, there is a maximum of 12 units you can take as a limited student. And, um, you know, we highly encourage you that if you do pursue limited status, that you apply as soon as possible for formal admission. Because although limited status is a great option, it does not guarantee whatsoever that you'll be an, a formally admitted into a program. So you want to make sure that you apply um, as, as early as possible. So if you're interested in limited status, you can go to the link there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and, and for those of you that may have joined a little bit later, I will send a copy of today's presentation along with uh, a, a link to the recording. So you will have access to all the links that are provided here. Um, we also have a tuition deferment program, and this program is geared towards those um, that may work for a company that, that pays 75 to 100% of the tuition. 
if this um, applies to you, then the deferment program allows you to defer upfront payment until after the semester is over, which you know allows you to not have to pay out of pocket, um, you know, and have to rush to get your your bill paid for. So um, this is an option, and if, if you meet the requirements, we do encourage you to find out more information on the link there. This gives you an idea of our tuition and fee structure. So, you know, the best way to figure out or estimate how much your program will cost is to to look at the either the per unit cost or the uh, unit cost for or the three unit course cost, which is the majority of the courses that are offered. So, you can get an idea of how much your program will cost based off of the number of units or courses that you'll need to take. Um, and and you can find out more information about tuition and fees on the link provided there. So to get started, um, as I mentioned before, you know, you can apply for a formal admission. Um, for those of you on campus, you know, you can also visit USC's campus. Um, we do have a number of events. Um, we actually have a preview day that's coming up on November 10th, if that's something that you're interested in and able to join as well. And of course, that also includes our online kind of attribute applicants. You're also welcome to come to campus if you, if you are in the area, but of course, you don't have to. Um, we have a variety of different ways to um, ask questions and interact. Um, we do encourage you to get started, um, whether it's via limited status or, um, or formal admission. So for Jennifer Turby students specifically, this is applies to you. For limited status, again, you can apply for spring, the spring 2018 semester. So if you're interested in doing that, we do highly recommend that you complete a Jennifer Turby profile. So there's actually no deadline to submit this profile, but we do encourage you to, to submit it as soon as possible so that you can get started um, you know, before the semester starts and at least a week before the semester starts, the week of January 8th. So now we'll go on to answer some of the questions that we didn't get the chance to answer, answer earlier. So let me go through some of the questions here that we can answer for you as best as possible. <coughs> so let's see, I have a question here. Um, so would the applicant's work experience in mechanical or aerospace engineering industry have an impact on admission? Uh, generally, we mostly look at academic records, uh, but uh, you know, this type of uh, real world experience in industry could be reflected in uh, uh, these optional reference letters and uh, that definitely will be considered. Um, let's see. I see that there's quite a few um, individual ones as well. Let's see. Um, I did see one earlier, um, that a question about um, for master's students, are they able to do conduct research and work with a faculty advisor? It was here. But Which one is that? I yeah. can't see it. Um, so the question was, you know, are master's students um, able to conduct research um, and potentially work with a faculty advisor? Uh, this is very uh, unlikely, simply for the reason that uh, uh, any research activity normally requires, uh, you know, sort of personal contact being on campus. And in fact, most of our master's students just get degree based on uh, these 27 units of classes. Some opt for four units of master thesis, but not very often. So in terms of my experience in uh, uh, working with students uh, from industry that actually hold uh, you know, a job at the same time as they are studying is uh, only with PhD students. So PhD students uh, who are locally here uh, may, uh, you know, they make time to come to campus and uh, discuss their, uh, their research uh, with, with an advisor. But for master students, it doesn't happen 
often. Okay, great. Let's see. I have another. Um, another question. Is it possible for students to transition from an MS program to a PhD track? Yes, it is entirely possible. In fact, uh, students with master's degree uh, get, you know, credit for classes that they took. So they require fewer, uh, less classes that would, you know, are required for PhD degree. PhD degree requires 60 units beyond bachelor's degree. Uh, so uh, let's say with degree with uh, 27, 30 units, uh, master degree, you are already halfway through the coursework. But of course, PhD uh, will require additional work on research topic. So uh, that that would be additional time, and uh, that requires, in fact, establishing uh, some relation with the faculty member who would be interested in particular topic. Great. I have another but it's possible, I think okay. that was the question. Great. Transition is possible. So another question is So it was a question about if um if international students have less of a chance um of, you know, getting into a program than uh, than a domestic student. I so don't think mechanical specifically. No, I don't think we we look at uh, you know the country of origin. We just look at application, mm -hmm. academic credentials, uh, maybe reference letters. That's pretty much all that determines. Uh, right, perfect. Um, I had a question here that I saw earlier um, that I can address. So the question was, um, if you have if someone had graduate. Uh, credit from another institution, and the answer is that um, you're able to transfer up to four units of graduate credit, um, but it has to be approved by the department of uh, the, the department. So, if and when you are admitted into a program, then um, you can work with the acad your academic advisor that's assigned to you, and they can um, work with you to try to to see to determine whether or not. You those credits, graduate credits from another institution can be transferred. I over. may add here that procedure is actually very simple. You have to uh, submit the syllabus of the course that you would like to be transferred and to point out to us the class that in our program that uh, would be replaced so we can compare if this is uh, the same material. And in general, uh, you know, basic engineering classes are quite similar, so, uh, you know, I've been signing many of such requests. Uh, I don't think uh, that would be a problem. Great. But there is a limit for units. Got it. Perfect. Now let's see. Um, I see another one. Is there any restrictions to number of courses one can enroll per semester? There is no restriction, but the practice is that uh, if a student enrolls in too many, they quickly drop some of the classes before deadlines because it's uh, rather difficult to take more than three classes a semester. And for people with, uh, let's say, full-time job or even half-time job, uh, even that is uh, often too many. So I think the students actually in industry here, local industry, they take at most two, sometimes just one per semester because there are, they have other obligations at work and often family obligations. Great. So I think it looks like we answered the majority of the questions. Um, the rest of them look like they're a little bit more specific to individual situations. So, um, you know, Megan and I will still remain online to answer any of those remaining questions that were not already answered. Um, if, however, you have um, more questions, feel free to, you know, keep 
keep typing them in. Um, but, you know, after this session, if you have other questions, for those of you that are on campus, you'll want to make, or that want to pursue their program on campus, you'll want to make sure that you email um, this first um, email address, so returbi.gradprograms at usd.edu. Um, also, if you have any questions about PhD programs, you'll also want to um, email the on-campus team. Um, those of you that wish to pursue your program online via Dena Viterbi, um, or, you know, not sure if you want to, but, you know, still have questions about the online delivery method, we do encourage you to email us at denetviterbi.usd.edu. That reaches um, both Megan and I as well as our other colleagues. Um, so we will, you know, respond to your question within a 24-hour period. You will, you will receive an answer. And um, if you, you prefer to chat about your questions um, over the phone, sometimes a lot of times that's a lot easier, you can um, do that as well. Um, so with that being said, again, thank you so much for joining us for today's session, for taking time out of your busy days. We hope that you found it informative. I want to thank um, Professor Domodovsky again for his time. Um, and My pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day.